this uh, third installment of the is a long um, so it's a long three lecture series. So this is the, the third year as I just said earlier. And uh, as like every year we're very happy to have to invite the uh being to invite the uh, uh, first rate, first uh, absolute top caliber geometer to take the practice to see it. And uh, before I um, introduce the speaker, um, this I should say that this is a this is a event that's organized by the Civica and the, the Taiwanese Mathematics Society. And so before we start, I would like to ask the president of the Mass Association to do more. So Professor Chang. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, because uh,
recent progress in difference geometry and relativity. And today is his first lecture. And the uh, subtitle is called Minimal Subtitle from Sportsman. So let's go to the position. sequence of talks which are, 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 are quite related. Uh, and in, in the first lecture, I'm going to talk about uh, a subject in differential geometry, which in a way is a very old subject, but is also uh, currently a very active subject, which is uh, having a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of activity and, and, and solving some, some, uh, some very interesting problems. So I'd like to at least give a flavor for that in, the, in this first lecture. So this is, uh, uh, these are, and also manifolds, and so and so. I'm going to start just by uh, introducing uh, the subject and giving giving some uh, <coughs> very classical uh, examples. Uh, and then in part two, I'm going to talk about variational theory and three recent applications of variational theory. Actually, all three are quite striking, I think. And then in the third part, I'm going to talk about uh, maybe a lesser known connection of normal surfaces with with eigenvalue problems. And it, it's partly I'm going to talk about a very specific new theorem, but it's partly to lay the ground for the third lecture, which will go into more detail on that, uh, uh, in that area. The second lecture, uh, if you read the, uh, the poster, is, is, is in relativity. So it's again, it uses also the different ideas. Okay, so, so let me first introduce uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, concept of general semantical. So, so the starting point is, uh, is if we, uh, so in, in geometry we measure things. So if we, if we take a curve in space or or if we take a surface, we can measure the length of the curve or the area of the surface. More generally, if we take a k-dimensional <coughs> submanifold uh, of, a, of a n dimensional uh, Riemannian manifold, then we can measure its k-dimensional volume. Okay, and so then and then what we can do is we can study how the volume changes when we when we vary the submanifold. So we can, if you like, we can think of the volume as an energy and we can try to minimize the energy or look for critical points of the energy. And so uh, the relevant Calculation there is if we, we we can think of varying the submanifold by using a vector field. So if we take a vector field, so I've got some arrows there, we can take the vector field and we can push the submanifold. So in particular, we can take a family of diffeomorphisms, which uh, uh, whose initial derivative is that uh, given by the vector field, and then uh, and then we can look at the image sigma t. So we look at what happens when we vary sigma, and then we can ask how the volume changes. And there's a basic formula which is uh, actually, if we take sigma, if we take x to be orthogonal to sigma, uh, it turns out that the logarithmic rate of change of the volume is is calculated in terms of uh, the mean curvature of the sigma. And so the formula is this one. Uh, and so uh, h here is the mean curvature. So let me just remind you, it, it, the mean curvature is the trace of the second fundamental form. And in general, it's a uh, second fundamental form is is, is vector value. So what it, what it measures we call it surface theory, is it measures the normal, um, <clears throat> it measures the, the normal component of the uh, curvature of the curve on the, on the surface. So if we think of taking a surface, we take a vector of a point, then we can take any curve through that, uh, which is tangent to that vector, and then when we compute its curvature vector, its, it's acceleration, really, it has a normal component. And that normal curvature is the second fundamental form in that in that direction. So generally, the second fundamental form is a, is a symmetric quadratic form of values in the normal uh, the normal space at a point. And so uh, the mean curvature is the trace of that. So if we if we do hypersurfaces, then the, the mean curvature is the sum of the principal curvatures for, uh, for, a, uh, for a hypersurface. And the mean curvature is, is precisely the quantity that comes into this basic calculation. So so the the, the, the rate of change of the volume is determined by the component of the mean curvature vector in the direction of x. So we're moving in a particular direction, and the volume changes depending on the uh, infinitesimally depending on that the uh, air product of the nature of x. Okay, so 
Okay, so, um, so in particular, uh, from this basic formula, uh, we can see that uh, uh, a submanifold sigma stationary, that is, the, the volume doesn't change the first order, for all deformations, if and only if h is, is zero. Okay, so these submanifolds would satisfy the condition that the mean curvature zero are called minimal submanifolds. And uh, I should say that minimal doesn't necessarily mean volume minimizing. So, so it turns out that this problem has a lot of <coughs> critical parts uh, when you consider uh, critical points with volume. There are lots of critical points which don't minimize. There's some which do, but, but a, lot of them, a lot of them don't. And I'll say more about that, particularly in part two, the variation, the variation part. Um, okay, and so let me give some examples. So, so minimal surfaces in R3 have been studied for hundreds of years. So uh, I'll give a few examples. So it's one of the very basic problems in the calculus of variations. Uh, we studied already in the 18th century. And so uh, this, the, uh, the first example is what's called the cat model. So this is the, this is the minimal surface you get by looking for uh, uh, surfaces of mean curvature zero, which are surfaces of revolution. And the, the curve that determines it's rotated here is the is the hyperbolic cosine curve. Uh, it's rotated about an axis. So that surface is called the catenoid, uh, and it was, uh, it was found by Euler in 1744. Uh, the next basic example is the, uh, the, the, uh, the helicoid, also found by Euler 30 years later in 1774. And it, it's a surface which is gotten by taking a line <coughs> perpendicular to an axis and rotating the line and, and moving it up the axis at constant constant uh, constant velocity. And so uh, the uh, the helicoid is familiar to gardeners. So if you're a gardener, you know that there's a you can hang a helicoid out of your garden and when the wind blows it will, it will spin. Maybe it will chase away the birds or something that can eat your uh, your vegetables. But it's a it's a very common uh, uh, shape which you which uh, which you see in, 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 in real life. Um, let me give a, a third example, which actually was discovered in the 19th century. So in the 19th century, there were many mathematicians who worked on minimal surface theory from the point of view of complex analysis. So it turns out there are ways using complex analytic functions to generate minimal surfaces. And, uh, and there were many, many examples. So many famous mathematicians have minimal surfaces named after them, for example, Riemann. Uh, uh, and uh, this, this particular surface is a triply periodic surface. It's a fundamental piece and fits together to form a, a triply periodic minimal surface. So the mean curvature is zero on that all at once. And then, um, lest you think that all minimal surfaces were discovered more than 100 years ago, let me give you uh, some examples which are more recent. So, so this, uh, this surface here is called the Costa surface. And it was, uh, it was <clears throat> first written down and uh, written down again using com complex function theory. Uh, and it was shown to be embedded by Hoffman and Meeks. So it was shown by Costa, Hoffman and shown embedded by Hoffman and Meeks. And, and that was in the 1980s. So this is a relatively recent uh, uh, example. So you can see it's a, it's a surface with three ends. So those, those ends go off to infinity, roughly asymptotically planar. There's an upper end, a lower end, and a middle end. And if you think about the topology of that, it's actually a, uh, a, a torus with three punctures. Genus one uh, surface with three boundary components, three points. Um, okay, and then there's a there's a, another uh, family of surfaces roughly built on the Costa surface. Again, they have three ends, but there are lots more handles, so you can put a lot of handles in there and get a very a high genus Costa surface. And so these were <coughs> first constructed using complex analytic methods, but I should say that. The, these surfaces are a very special case of the general construction of the couple of from the So there, there are lots of, lots of surfaces of very high genus that can be constructed, uh, which have nice behavior at, uh, at the um, Okay, and so um, let me just say, so there are lots and lots of examples of minimal surfaces. In fact, many of them are, uh, are, uh, are online. They can, be, they can be drawn using computer graphics because there are formulas that describe them. And so if you look, for example, there's a minimal surface library on the Indiana University website, which is uh, uh, organized by Matthias Weber. So if you if if just Google minimal surfaces, you'll find, you'll find huge numbers of 
huge class of researchers. So you can ask, well, maybe this is just such a large class that we can't say anything about them. But let me just mention one piece of theorem which, which provides some sort of limitation on what can happen. And so, um, so notice that of the examples we considered in the previous slides, they all have, so, so we have the first two, which were the helicoid. So the helicoid is topologically a plane, topologically R2. Um, and, um, and the catenoid, of course, is a, is a punctured plane, topologically. And so, um, so in particular, all of the examples, except the trivial one, I didn't draw the plane. The, 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 uh, the uh, flat plane is, of course, a surface. The plane and the helicoid are simply connected. So that means that that means that there's no that, that any closed curve on the surface can be shrunk to a point. And so, and so the, that property is equivalent to saying the surface is, is, is homeomorphic to the plane, R2. And so the, so of the examples we, we described, those were the only two that were like that. And actually in 2005 it was shown by Meeks and Rosenberg in fact that those are the only two. Uh, and it builds on work of holding in the cause. It's actually, it's actually quite a bit down. The plane and the helicoid are the simply connected, properly embedded. Surfaces. So that's a recent theory about surfaces, minimal surfaces in our theory. Um, okay, so, so that's, that finishes my basic introduction, which is mostly old, but I put in that last part just to show you that there's still a lot of work going on in uh, uh, conservative minimal surfaces in three space. I mean, they're by no means all under fully in the um, Okay, and so in the second part, I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to talk about the constructions of, of um, uh, minimal, um, uh, minimal surfaces and submanifolds uh, of higher dimensions. Uh, and, and I'm going to talk about variational constructions. And so uh, the, the basic existence question for minimal surfaces is called the plateau problem. And this, is a, this, this actually was apparently posed by Lagrange in 1760. Uh, it's named after the Belgian physicist Plateau, who actually did a lot of experimental work on soap films. So, so if, if you neglect gravity, that is the, the mass of the soap film, then the uh, then soap films satisfy the variational principle that they minimize area from the ground. And so they're a physical model that, that, that uh, uh, represents the geometric problem of minimal surfaces which minimize area. Right? So they only, we can only see the part that, uh, that minimizes as, as soap film, as local. Okay, and so uh, just to give a very rough formulation of the plateau problem, say we take a simple closed curve gamma in R3, then the problem is to find a surface that spans uh, gamma, <coughs> the curve in space. We want to find a surface that spans it, uh, which, uh, which has the smallest area. So that's the plateau problem. Okay, and so there are various technical issues involved in solving this. It's going to take a very long time to uh, to rigorously solve this problem. In fact, there are many different solutions which uh, which consider different classes of surfaces that, that, uh, to, as competitors. So, uh, so, so to make it precise, we have to say what type of surface we're allowing. For example, do we allow surfaces that are just topologically disks, or do we allow higher genus surfaces? Do we allow non-orientable surfaces, or just orientable ones? And do we allow our surfaces to be singular? Um, and the, another basic question is, what does it mean for a surface to bound and bound again? Okay, and so there, the, the, the answers to these questions really are different depending on what classes of, of competitors you, you want to consider. Okay, and so, uh, so here's a picture of, uh, just for a, sim a relatively simple closed curve, this blue curve. The, uh, the surface spanning it is, the, uh, is an area minimizer for the given wire. So you can take a wire and bend it in shape and dip it in a soap film, and then depending on how you pull it out, you'll get a uh, surface that spans the wire. And that surface is, uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, a minimal, uh, a stable minimal surface, one of the these areas. And so, um, so let me just say from a geometric point of view, we, we'd like to go beyond the, just the setting of surfaces in R3. So, we, uh, so I want to say something about what I call the generalized plateau problem. So, that, so we can, of course, pose the same problem in any dimension and co-dimension. Uh, and and we, can, we can replace R3 by, by any curve space, by a smooth relying manifold. So we could define, we could set up a generalized plateau problem. If we take a K minus one dimensional submanifold gamma, then we can look at, we assume it bounds a K-dimensional uh, uh, 
sub-manifold, then we can ask to minimize the volume uh, among all search, search sequence, like we'll have to generalize one to a problem. And we also, in geometry, want to consider, instead of uh, sub-manifolds with boundary, we want to consider closed sub-manifolds. And so uh, a nice way to formulate that is in terms of K-cycles. So, so a K-cycle we can think of as just a closed oriented sub-manifold in dimension K. So we take just a closed sub-manifold in a, in a manifold dimension K. Then we say two, two K-cycles are homologous if they are, the, their, their sum or their difference with orientation is the boundary of a K plus one dimensional sub-manifold. K cycles sigma one and sigma two, and then their homologous means that we can fill in, so we can find a we can find a, a k plus one dimensional guy whose boundary is this minus that, and, and so um, and so then we can formulate a generalized plateau problem in in a homology class. So given a K cycle sigma naught. We can ask to find a K-cycle which is homologous to sigma naught and has least one. And so in order to understand that, let's look at this following example. So, uh, so this, so our manifold now is a, is, is a torus uh, with some metric, some shape. And, um, and these blue curves are, are curves which minimize in their homology class. So, uh, so they're, they're closed curves. And they have the property that among all curves which are homologous, that is, which can be which the difference is a boundary, <coughs> is the boundary of the two-dimensional region on the surface, uh, that these are of smallest, smallest length. So, so, so this is another well-posed problem, which uh, I'll refer to as a generalized quantum problem. OK, and so, so what's, what's known about solvability? Well, historically, the first uh, uh, general solvability result for the uh, plateau problem uh, was in the case of uh, uh, surfaces in R3, which were simply connected, that is, with this, this type of surfaces. And so this was solved by Jesse Douglas in 1930. In fact, he won the first field run for, for solving the uh, rigor, getting a rigorous solution of the problem. OK, and let me say that the, the ideas of, of Douglas have been uh, expanded greatly over, uh, over, uh, over the years. And in fact, there are many, many interesting uh, uh, results uh, where so the so the idea is here you look at you look at competitors which are surfaces with fixed topology two-dimensional surfaces with fixed topology okay and so although there are many extensions the method involved here is fundamentally two-dimensional so this, the, these kinds of ideas only work directly to solve a two-dimensional problem it can be done in an arbitrary manifold so you can consider a high-dimensional curved manifold and although there's substantial extensions of those as work they, they have there is uh, a lot of work on that. That direction, but but if you look for solutions which are dimension bigger than two, then then these methods just won't work. And so um, and so that uh, actually there are several different frameworks that people propose to solve the the plateau problem in high, for higher dimensional so manifold. But the, by far the most successful one is the theory of integral currents, which was developed around 1960, was done by Federer um, uh, and Fleming. <coughs> And uh, in this case, the, the minimizer is constructed as a limit of a minimizing sequence. And, and in order to take that limit, you have to understand how to, how to, um, how to complete the space of smooth um, uh, submanifolds with bounded volume. So, so if you take a minimizing sequence, you need to be able to take a limit. And so you, you have to, just from the fact that the volume is bounded, you need, you need to prove convergence to some reasonable object. And so so the, uh, the problem is that the, the limits of smooth submanifolds may be quite singular. Okay, so, so generally, uh, you, the, these, these limits are called, uh, uh, well, they're, they're integral currents. They're, they're rectifiable, but they can have lots and lots of singularities. So, they're, they're, so, so the price to be paid for this, so you, you're expanding the class of competitors so that you can solve the problem. Uh, but on the other hand, the, in order to do that, you have to allow competitors which are extremely singular. So, and so, uh, and so, then you have another problem, which is the problem of showing that minimizers actually aren't that bad. In other words, they they uh, they, uh, they have uh, some reasonable regularity problems. And so, uh, and so, the regularity theory is also a very important story in, in 
geometric measure theory and PDE as well. So, so the solution of the generalized plateau problem is actually the impetus for developing important methods in PDE, which have to do with partial regularity solutions. So there are many physical and geometric problems where <clears throat> when, you, when you take minima or critical points, you don't expect the solutions to be everywhere smooth. And so, and so prior to about 1960, there was no PDE uh, theory which dealt with issues like that. In other words, you either were able to get estimates and construct smooth solutions, or, or, um, uh, or you couldn't deal with the problem. And so, uh, and so one of the important ideas or methods that came out of the regularity theory was sort of partial regularity methods in general. They've been used in many, many different contexts. And so, um, so, so let me just say that there are many cases where singularities can't be avoided for the plateau problem. For example, if you take a complex variety in CN, so just the, just the zero set of a, of a complex analytic function, then that's always a volume minimizing submanifold. And of course, if the function has a critical point, then that submanifold will be singular. Right? And, so, and so there are singularities that just naturally occur uh, in the generalized plateau problem. However, it, it was assumed uh, that singularities for volume minimizers could only occur when the co-dimension is bigger than one. So like complex varieties have co-dimension at least two. But it, it turns out that, that a, a big surprise in the subject, which was uh, a combination of the work of several people in the 60s, uh, showed that when in co-dimension one, that is when we have a hypersurface in high dimension, so n at least eight, singularities do sometimes occur. So there are examples of singular uh, uh, volume minimizers in high dimensions, which are hypersurfaces, real hypersurfaces. So, and so this leads me to one of the questions I always ask whenever I talk about literal submanifolds, which is the question of the stability of singularity. So, so there's a question that we don't understand really at all on the subject, and that is, that is if, if you, we know that there are examples, one can write down, you can construct explicit examples of singular volume minimizing submanifolds, but what, what we don't know is whether or not they're stable in the sense that we had a submanifold with boundary, it may be that by, by perturbing the boundary, the singularity disappeared by a small perturbation of the boundary. Or uh, similarly, if we were working in this uh, case of cycles, it might happen that by varying the Riemannian metric a little bit, the singularities in, in a given homology class actually disappear. So we don't know whether that's, that's, uh, that happens or not. So the question is, are there singularities which occur in an open set of, of for an open set of metrics uh, we are given that. And, and the only thing that's known about it, as far as I know, is, is in the lowest dimensional case, that is in dimension eight. In that case, singularities are isolated. And in fact, in that case, it turns out that they are, they're unstable. They can be completely right. In, in higher dimensions, it's, uh, it's simply not known. But it would be very, very interesting to understand how to, uh, the uh, persistence or not of, of singularities when we data is mature. Okay, so another important um, um, idea in, um, in any variational problem really is the second variation. Because just as in calculus, when you study critical points of the function, in order to understand whether the critical point is a local minima or maximum uh, of, the, of the function uh, or a saddle point, uh, the way you do that is to look at the second derivatives. Right? So you look at the Hessian matrix, the matrix of second derivatives. And exactly the same thing works here, at least if we have a smooth. So it's just that the, uh, the second variation, so if you think of doing a deformation and computing the second derivative of the volume, then what we get is a quadratic expression in, uh, involving the vector field and, and the geometry of the manifold. And I'm just going to write this down in the simplest case, which is when we have a hypersurface. So we have, so we have a... Um, we have a minimal hypersurface. We assume it has an everywhere defined unit normal vector U. And we take our vector field of x to be a function of time limit. Okay, so those are those are normal deformations, and we're assuming we have a, uh, a everywhere defined unit normal vector field. And so the deformation is really given by a function on the submanifold. So it just simplifies the formula for the, for the second variation. Um, I heard it here, so x is p times nu. So the second variation is a calculation to see that it's, it's given by this quadratic expression. So this is the Dirichlet integral of p on the surface. p is a smooth function on the surface. 
This is the, uh, the square length of the second fundamental form, so it's the sum of squares of principal curvatures. And this is the Ricci curvature in the ambient uh,